Hi, and welcome to the Math Skills Centre workshop, Introduction to R. In this workshop, I'll be walking you through our studio, um, how to write code in a script, how to import and view data in R, how to wrangle your data, and finally, how to plot data with ggplot2. Throughout this workshop, we'll be using this workshop page, and at the same time, I will also be referring to our studio. So you can watch this workshop, code along, and at the points where there are exercises, you can stop the video, attempt the exercise, and then come back to this recording. So let's start off by taking a look at the various panels in our studio. When you first open up our studio, there will be three panels open, one big one to the left and two smaller ones to the right. The first thing we'll do is click on new file in the top left corner and then on our script. Now we all have four panels. The top left panel is the scripting area. This is where we will write our code for our studio to execute. You can think of this a bit like a Word document as we'll be saving this code and then at a later point you can come back, open the file and run that code again. In the bottom left corner, we have the console area. This is where our studio will communicate with us. So whenever we run code from the script, our studio will return some kind of output to us in the console. Now it's also possible to write our code in the console. However, this is then not saved as part of our script. So it's better to always write code in the scripting area. In the top right, we have the environment, and this is where our studio will list all the files uh, and objects that we create. So whenever we create or import something into R, it will appear in the environment. And finally, in the bottom right, we have various tabs. The one that is open right now is the files tab. And once we download some files for this workshop and put them in an appropriate folder, they will appear in the bottom right. Whenever you work in RStudio, it's good practice to do so from within an RStudio project. This is a self-contained environment for the particular analysis that you're performing. And this environment will contain all the input files that you require and also all the output that you generate. To start a new project, as we'll do for this workshop, click on File in the top left corner and then on New Project. If our studio asks you about saving the workspace image, you can tell it to not save. Now we'll create this project in a new directory, which means in a new folder, and we'll tell our studio that we want a new project. We'll give this folder a name, for example, introduction, lower dash to, lower dash, our studio. Whatever name you choose, make sure that there are no spaces. Okay, so if you would like to have something that um, looks like a space, you can use lower dashes. And then our studio will ask us where we want this folder to live. So in my case, I'm happy with the default uh, location. But if you want to put it somewhere else, uh, for example, as part of your documents folder, then you can click on browse, navigate to your documents folder, and save this new directory there. Once you've done that, you can click on Create Project. And then our studio will open up the project for us. Once our studio has opened the new project, you will see in the bottom right-hand corner that this .rproj file has appeared. This file marks our new project, and so whenever we want to open the project after closing our studio, we can do so by double-clicking on the rproj file. The rproj file also marks our working directory. This is the location where our, by default, will look for input files, and also where, by default, it will save output files. Let's um, obtain the data for this workshop and put it inside our working directory or our project directory. Let's first off create folders, a folder for the data. So click on new folder and name the folder 
data. And while we're at it, we can also create a folder for our results. So again, new folder and results. To obtain the data for this workshop, navigate to the workshop page. In the workshop page, under section 2.3, there are links to two datasets, nhanes.csv and iris.csv. Right-click on a link, and then the data will be opened on a new, in a new tab. Then save this data by um, saving the page as, and then you can keep the default name and Haynes dot and Haynes, but add dot CSV to the end. Okay. Now also make sure that you are saving it inside the project working directory. In my case, introduction to our studio and then data. I will do the same for the iris data. So right click, open in a new tab, save the page as iris.csv. And again, inside the data folder. Now, if we navigate back to our studio and we click on the data folder, we can see that the data sits inside our project directory. In the following section we'll be going through some common R Studio terminology surrounding writing code in a script. So I will navigate to R Studio, where first we will be looking at creating things in R. Now anything that we create within R Studio is called an object. And whenever we create an object, we assign something to that object. For example, we might create the object named 4, and to this we can assign the number 4. Okay, So 4 is the value, the number that we are assigning using this arrow to an object named 4. Now if we actually want to create this object, we need to click on Run. Alternatively, there's a keyboard shortcut if you're using Windows, you would use Control Enter, and if you were using Mac, it would be Command Return. But for clarity, for you watching the screen, I will click on the Run button. So after I click on Run, we can see in the console that R has uh, registered our request. Okay, it says, "Okay, you asked me to assign four to an object named four." And in addition, we can see that something has appeared in our environment in the top right hand corner. So now we have an object named 4, which contains the number 4. Often when working with our studio, we make use of functions. These are built in capabilities in our studio which perform particular tasks. For example, we might use a function which rounds numbers for us. Now whenever we use a function, we do that by writing the name of that function followed by brackets. So in the case of the round function, we type round followed by brackets. And notice here that even though I only typed opening bracket, our studio automatically puts the closing bracket there for me as well. Now inside a function, we specify arguments. Okay. Um, inside round, for example, we specify an argument which is the number which we would like to round. Say we give round the value 3.14. If I then click on run, then we see that our studio returns three to us, which indeed is 3.14 rounded. Now often when we use functions, we want to control their behavior. And we can do this with further arguments, which take particular options. For example, the round function takes the argument digits, with which we can control the number of digits behind the decimal. So if we set digits to equal 1 and press run, then our studio returns 3.1 to us, which indeed is rounding 3.14 to one digit behind the decimal. 
You can now have a go at the first exercise of this workshop, which you can find under section 3.1.3, where you're asked to assign the value 6.667 to an object and calling round on that object. Often we want to work with more than just one value, and we want to have that data stored together. Um, we can do this inside a vector. So a vector is an RStudio object which takes multiple values of the same kind. For example, we might create an object called numbers in which we want to store a set of numbers. So again, we use the arrow to assign and then we use C bracket. C bracket is the function with which we create vectors. And inside C bracket, we give the values uh, that we want in the vector. So for example, one through to six, which need to be separated by commas. Now, if I press run, we see that numbers has appeared in the environment. Vectors don't necessarily have to have numbers. They can also have words which in our studio are referred to as strings. So we might create a vector called colors, to which we assign C bracket and a set of colors. Now it's important when you write strings in our studio that you write them inside double or inside quotes. Then our studio will recognize them as strings. So quote, red, quote, green, well, blue, if I press run, we will now see in the environment that we have created the vector colors. Whenever you write code in a script, it's good practice to leave comments as part of your code. So these are pieces of text which our studio does not interpret as code and can help you and others understand what is going on inside the script. Comments are preceded by the hash. Um, so whenever our studio sees a hash, it knows that what the text that follows is a comment. So for example, above our colors uh, piece of code, I could leave hash and say, create a vector of colors. And above numbers, we could say, create a vector of numbers. So throughout this workshop, I'll be leaving comments throughout the script, and I encourage you to do so as well, to get into the habit. Because when you write a, a script, sometimes you can understand fairly well what it is that you've written, but then when you come back to it at a later date, sometimes it can be hard to remember why exactly the script works or how exactly it functions. And in those situations, it's really useful to have comments to remind you how everything works. So you can now have a go at the following exercise, which you can find under section 3.1.5. You will come to use many functions as you use RStudio, and some of these functions won't be installed when you first open up RStudio. In order to install these functions and use them, you need to go through a couple of steps. The first is installing the package in which the function comes. So many uh, functions will be bundled together inside one package. And these functions will be working on similar types of things. So for example, in a moment we'll be loading a we'll be installing a package uh, which has functions for importing data into our studio. Once you have installed the package, you then need to load the package. Okay? So installing the package is something that you do once and never have to do again. But loading the package is something that you have to do every time you open up our studio again. And you can think of this a bit like installing a new light bulb. You only have to screw the new light bulb into the socket once, but every time you want to use the light bulb, you need to flick the light switch. And so you only install a package once, but every time you want to use the package, you need to load it again. Okay? So let's have a look at this process. So we said the first step is to install a package and we're going to install the read R package. Now this is going to be the only thing in this workshop that we actually write inside the console. 
I told you before that in general we don't write code inside the console, but because installation is something that we only have to do once, we tend to not include it inside the script, because then we would install the package again every time we run our script. So inside the console we write install.packages and then inside quotes we write read r and press enter. Now our studio will install this package for us which can sometimes take a while since our studio needs to download and then install the package. Once the package has been installed we can load it using library. Now, library, running library is something that we do do inside the script and in general it's recommended to do this at the top of your script. So you will have all your library commands at the top of your script such that when you give your script to someone else they can instantly see what packages they must install in order to use your script. So in the meantime it looks like the read R package has been installed and so now we can go to the top of our script, leave a comment, which is load packages, and then load the read R package using library. Library, read R. And here you don't actually need to use the quotes. Now if I press run, we can see in the console that R has registered this command and it seems to have worked fine because we haven't received any errors. Usually we do not want to be entering individual data points into our studio inside a vector manually because this is quite error prone and it requires a lot of time. So more commonly we want to introduce data from some kind of data file and it's quite common to introduce data from a CSV spreadsheet. So let's have a go at introducing data from such a file. We'll leave ourselves a comment, importing the public health data. And we might call the object, which will contain our data, health lower dash data. To this we assign something that comes out of the function read lower dash CSV. And notice how read lower dash CSV comes from the read R package which we loaded earlier in this workshop. To read lower dash CSV, we provide um, the location of our data, which recall we saved inside the data folder under the name nhanes.csv. So to read CSV, we provide data slash nhanes.csv. We press run. And then we see that health data has appeared in our environment. Once we have imported data from a spreadsheet, we need to make sure that the data looks as we expect it to look. Because sometimes errors can happen when we introduce data into our studio. So we're going to go through a few ways of looking at our data. The first is to view the data set as a whole. So we can say view the whole data set. And we do that using the view function. Note here that we use a capital V. So view, brackets, health, lower dash data. And when I press run, this opens up a new tab where we can see the data set as a whole. This can be quite good for scrolling through the data, making sure that the columns look as we expect them to look, and that data looks as we expect it to look. The second option is to look at a reduced section of the data. Now, particularly when you have a large data set, say 10,000 observations in this case, it can be a bit unhandy to scroll through the data as a whole. And especially if you get many more columns as well, it can take quite a while to load the data in a new tab. So in those cases, it can be useful to look at the first few rows of our data. So view first few rows of the data. And we do that using the head function. So head bracket health lower dash data. After pressing run, 
R returns to us the first six rows of our data in the console. And again, we can check the column names, we can look at the data itself, and R also tells us what type of data it believes each column contains. Next thing we can do is to look at the dimensions of our um, data. This we can do using the nCol and nRow functions. So, view dimensions of data with nCol health data. We get the number of columns, which is five as we expect and n row health data gives us the number of rows 10,000 as we expect finally we can get a summary view of our data using the summary function summary view of our data running the summary function on health lower dash data. This gives us for each column a set of values. For columns with continuous data such as age um, we get the mean, the median, quartiles, min and max. And when uh, for some columns we also receive NAs. And these are rows for which data is missing. So in our height data there are 1022 rows where data is missing and with the weight column there are 431 rows where data is missing. Now it's quite common um, certainly in public health to have missing data so having NAs is not necessarily um, an issue. However if you expect your data to be complete but running summary shows you that you have some NAs that suggests that something went wrong when introducing the data. You can now have a go at the challenge at the end of section 4.3 where you will introduce the IRIS data set into our studio and view the data. Once we have imported our data and made sure that the data looks as we expect it to look, we can move on to data wrangling. This is the process of manipulating the data in such a way that it becomes ready for downstream analyses. Now, in the data wrangling section, we will be making use of the dplyr package. So before we move on to actually doing some data wrangling, you can have a go at the challenge at the top of section 5.1, where you will install and load the dplyr package. Once we have installed the dplyr package and loaded it using the library function, we can use the functions contained inside dplyr. The first function that we will use is filter, which can be used to filter particular rows from our data set. So, for example, we might um, filter for female participants, in which case we can use the filter function on um, health data. Where we say sex equals female. Now notice here the use of double equals sign. Pressing run shows in the console data that only contains female participants. Filter can also be used with continuous variables. So for example, we can filter for participants with height less than 170 centimeters, in which case we would type filter bracket health lower dash data with height less than 170. After pressing run, we can see that height of remaining participants is below 170. To select particular rows, we use the select function, also from the dplyr package. So we might want to select specifically um, the ID column and the height column. So select ID and height columns. 
And in that case, we would type select the name of the data, so health lower dash data. And then we would provide within a vector the names of the columns that we wish to keep. So in this case, C bracket ID, comma, height. Pressing run, we see that only two columns are left, which are the columns that we requested. We can also use select to uh, remove particular columns that we are not interested in. So explicitly say which columns we don't want. So for example, if we wanted to remove the uh, weight column, we could say select with health lower dash data minus C bracket weight. And so the minus is telling R that we want to remove this particular column. And we see all columns are left except for weight. Now finally, we can save um, one of these um, data sets to a new object. So for example, if we wanted to remove uh, the weight column, we could say health data no weight, so we provide a new name, and to this we assign what comes out of select health data minus C bracket weight. So I'm just going to copy and paste, leave a comment, remove the weight column, and create new object. And if I run this, we can see that we no longer have the data printed to the console, but instead we have a new object in our environment. It is quite common to perform multiple data wrangling steps one after the other, and there are various ways in which we could do this. So the most tedious way to do this would be to create a new object for every step in our data wrangling. So we might start off by introducing health data into our studio using read CSV, then creating a new object called health data no weight, where we remove the weight column. And maybe then we would have another step where we um, select for female participants and create a new object. In that case we might create health data no weight only female where we would run filter on health data no weight and say sex equals female. Pressing run, we then obtain yet another object which now doesn't have the weight column and only has data from female participants. Now this becomes tedious because we're creating a new object every time. And in addition, due to that, we have basically um, long code. So an easier way to do this is to link multiple commands together. And we can do that using the pipe. The pipe looks like this, percentage greater than percentage. And whenever you see a pipe in your mind, you can read it as then. So let's see this in practice. We might have... Um, we might again create health data no weight only female where as before we start with our data so health lower dash data so we are now assigning health data to this object called health data no weight only female but we use a pipe which we read as then. So we have health data, no weight, only female, equals health data, then, 
select minus C bracket weight pi filter sex equals female. So all of this together is health data, then select all but the weight column, then filter for participants of the female sex. And so when we run all this, we still get health data no weight, only female, but we don't have to create health data no weight, and we have a much more compact piece of code. Okay. So, data wrangling with the pipe. Notice that when we use the pipe, we no longer have to specify the data inside select and filter. This is because the data is passed through by the pipe. So the pipe passes health data to select, and then what comes out of select is passed to filter again by the pipe. You can now have a go at data wrangling on the iris data set on the challenge under section 5.2. In addition to filtering for particular rows and selecting particular columns, we might want to create a new column based on existing columns in our data. For example, we might want to calculate the BMI of participants based on their height and weight. Creating new columns is done using the mutate function which also comes from the dplyr package. So let's have a go at that. We leave a comment that says create BMI column. And we're also going to save this in a new object. So we might say health lower dash data lower dash BMI. To this we assign health data then or pipe mutate. Okay, so with mutate we're going to create this BMI column. So to mutate we provide the name of the column that we want to create, in this case BMI, equals, and then we tell mutate how to create this column. Now in the case of BMI, this is calculated by weight divided by height. And height is divided by 100 in this case squared. Okay. Now the exact calculation of BMI is not the important point here. The important point is that with mutate we are creating a new column which is called BMI. And we're saving this to the health data BMI object using the pipe. Okay. So pressing run and clicking on health data BMI or using head we can see that the BMI column has been added to our data. Often we want to summarize our data in a way that the default summary function cannot do for us. So we need to give our more specific instructions on how we want the data to be summarized. For example, we might want to summarize our height data grouped by sex. So we'll leave ourselves a comment. Summarize height grouped by sex. And we can do this within our studio by starting off with health lower dash data. Then using the group lower dash by function to group our data by sex and then piping to the summarize function. Now notice that this, this is summarize rather than summary which we used earlier on. So summarize. Inside summarize we can define how we want the data to be summarized and everything that we define needs to have a name. So we might ask for the number of observations in each group and we can do this uh, by providing a name, say n, and that is going to equal n bracket. 
and the end bracket function counts the number of observations. Then outside the bracket we type comma, enter, and then we write the next thing that we would like to have summarized, which is going to be the mean. So we might write mean lower dash height equals mean bracket of height. Okay. Here our studio will calculate the mean height grouped by sex and store this under a column called mean lower dash height. Finally, we might want the standard deviation of the height, and so similarly, that will be equal to SD of height. Running all this gives us the data below with sex, number of observations. However, for the mean and the standard deviation, we are receiving NAs. And this is quite common. This happens when at least one of the observations in our data contains an NA. And mean and SD by default return an NA. So the way to overcome it, I overcome this, or one of the ways at least, is to simply remove the NAs from the data before we calculate the mean and the standard deviation. And this we can do using the drop NA function. So we might add another line. So health data pipe, and then drop lower dash NA in height. Okay, so here we are removing any NAs that we have in height, so that we can then calculate the mean and standard deviation. However, when we run this, we're going to encounter one more roadblock, which is that R tells us error in drop NA, could not find function drop NA. This error is returned when we're trying to use a function that comes in the library which we have not loaded. Now the drop NA function comes in the tidy R package which we have not loaded. Okay, So first we need to install the package if we haven't done that before. So install.packages tidy R and at the top of our script we need to include library tidy r and we need to wait for the package to install and once it has installed successfully we can load the package within our script now going back to our code <coughs> pressing run we see that now we have the mean and standard deviation for height grouped by sex. After wrangling our data, we may want to export the object as a new spreadsheet so that we can share the spreadsheet with a colleague or just come back to it at a later date. And we can do this using the write lower dash CSV function, which again comes in the read R package. Now, for example, we might choose to um, export our summary table. So in order to do this, first we need to save the summary table to an object. So summarize height group by sex and save to an object. And we might call this object height lower dash summary. Okay, so the table that we created below inside the console now appears inside our environment. Then we want to export height lower dash summary to a CSV file. And we do this using the write lower dash CSV function. Now write lower dash CSV first needs to take the object that we want to export. In this case, height lower dash summary. And then secondly, we need to provide the location where we want to save the data. So let's make use of the results folder that we created earlier in the workshop. So within quotes, we might say results dash, and then the name that we want the file to have, which we could use height lower dash summary dot CSV. 
pressing run and then clicking on the results folder we can see that the high summary.csv file has been created. You can now have a go at the challenge at the bottom of section 5.5 where you will uh, do some data wrangling and then export the data to a CSV file. Next we will learn how to plot data in our studio and for this we will use the ggplot2 package. So first we will install the package using install.packages ggplot2 and while that is installing we will scroll to the top of our script to include library ggplot2 Once the package has installed, we can run the library command and then ggplot2 is loaded. So we will look at the general structure of the ggplot command um, using an example of a height versus weight scatter plot. So let's leave a comment scatter plot of height versus weight. Whenever we create a plot using the ggplot2 package, we start off with the ggplot function. Now notice that ggplot does not have the 2. So ggplot2 is the name of the package, ggplot is the name of the function. Inside the brackets, we provide the name of the data that we wish to plot. So in this case, that will be health lower dash data. And secondly, we need to provide aesthetics inside the AES function. Okay. There are many different types of aesthetics that we can specify, um, but the core ones that we'll use now are the variables that we want on the y and x axes. So we're going to ask for height on the y axis and weight on the x axis. So far we've told R that we want a ggplot of the health data with, y on the, with height on the y-axis and x on the weight on the x-axis, but we have not yet told our studio what type of plot we want. So this is the next step. Rather than using a pipe, as we did in data wrangling, we use a plus to put together different ggplot functions. So we use a plus, enter, and then we specify the type of plot that we want. In this case, that will be geom lower dash point bracket, which is the function, the ggplot function for creating a scatter plot. So pressing run. We see that our studio has created the scatter plot for us. We also receive a warning here about removed rows with missing values. This is due to the NAs in our data and is not an issue at this point. You can now have a go at the exercise at the bottom of section 6.2 where you will try to create a box plot using ggplot. The ggplot2 package offers many different types of plots and in addition all the plots are very customizable. It's practically impossible to remember every single ggplot function and so often when we are trying to create a plot of a particular kind, we consult Google for the specific function that we're looking for. So for example, say we wanted to add a title to our plot, but we couldn't remember what the function is to add a title. Well, in that case, we might Google um, ggplot add title. And then we would receive a set of tutorials. This is quite common um, when, when consulting Google for help with RStudio. I quite like this STHDA website. They tend to have quite clear tutorials, but many of the other ones would be good as well. The nice thing about this website is that we have a little index at the top of the page. And so we can see that one of the sections is change the main title and access labels. So clicking on that takes us to a section 
where we are advised to use GG title. We also see this P plus, and we might not be 100% sure of what that means, but that doesn't really make a difference. So one thing that you learn once you start to use these tutorials is that you don't necessarily have to read the entire tutorial to see what is going on. We can see here that um, the tutorial says we can change the plot titles using GG title. So we can just take that from the tutorial and see if it works in, inside our code. So returning to our code, we might now modify the comment and say scatter plot of height versus weight with title. Add a plus and then say gg title in quotes height versus weight in the NHANES data. After we press run, we see that a title has been added to our plot. Finally, we might want to export a plot that we created so that we can share it with others, and we can do this using the ggsave function. Now, ggsave will save the most recent plot that we created. So in my case, the most recent plot was the height versus weight plot with the title. So if I run ggsave, that is the plot that will be saved. So we tend to stick the ggsave command right after the section of our code where we create a plot of interest. Run ggsave. And there's a couple more things to notice about ggsave besides it saving the most recent plot. The first is that we need to provide a location for our data, and so we might again use the results folder. And we might call the plot height versus weight plot. So we provide a name and we provide a file extension. Now we might say PNG. ggsave will recognize PNG and then create a PNG file for us. But ggsave can create many other types of files as well. So you specify the type of file that you want inside the name um, of the file that you create. Okay, running ggsave. I can then see inside files and results that the height versus weight plot has been created. You can now have a go at the challenge at the bottom of section 6.4. Before closing our studio, always remember to save the script that you have been working on such that you can return to it at another point in time. You can do this by pressing on the floppy disk in the top left hand corner. When you close our studio, it might ask you whether you want to save the workspace image to r.rdata. Here R is asking you basically whether you want to keep the environment that you created. Usually this is not necessary because you can recreate the environment using your script, so this will unnecessarily take up disk space. So when this is asked, you can just say don't save.